recently flew from Minnesota to Hong Kong and then back again as a family. It was 25 hours of flying time and really it's 30 hours if you count from door to door. Three connecting flights with a 14 hour time zone change with three little humans all aged five and under. And here's how it went. I know this is gonna be a long video so I'm going to break this up into categories because that's how I think anyway. So feel free to jump around based on the timestamps listed below. And also before we begin, if you wouldn't mind giving this a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. So chapter one is booking the trip. Is there a perfect time? And the too long didn't read version is not really. For the flight from the US to Hong Kong, we left the house at 3 a.m. because we had a 5 a.m. flight and that was hard. We had to wake the kids up, get them dressed, haul them into the car while they're half asleep. So I don't recommend this if you have a choice. For us, the options were really slim pickings because this was before Hong Kong removed a lot of the quarantine rules so there weren't that many travelers going there in the first place and so there weren't very many good flight itineraries to pick from. I will say the benefit of leaving first thing in the morning is that once you get going it worked out pretty well because it was daytime and it matched their level of excitement of going on a trip. For the way back in contrast we left after bedtime and it was really good to have everyone asleep right away on the plane however this was the first leg of the journey only going from Hong Kong to Japan, which is a three, four hour flight. So then when we landed in Japan, we had to wake everyone up kind of from deep sleep and try to haul them off the plane get them through their security line, and it was also really hard. So in my ideal world, if there were endless options and endless budget to choose from, well, first of all, then I would fly first class. But removing that option, I think the ideal would be to line up that longest flight with natural bedtime, whatever that is, based on your home time. I know there are people who advise lining up like a baby's nap to when your flight times are, but in practice, that is really tricky because baby schedules can change and honestly, the excitement of the airport will throw everything off. So I wouldn't count on that, especially if you have multiple kids. Anything beyond that basic level of planning around bedtime is kind of beyond your control. Chapter two, let's talk about packing. Our strategy was to minimize the carry-ons and the rationale behind that is because there are only two adults and a limited number of hands to carry bags. We had a total of three backpacks and two strollers that came with us and we were really just holding the essentials. Baby items can be checked for free, so our car seat we checked at the airport. The strollers we kept with us to help the kids get around the airport and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. For checking bags, most airlines should offer at least one free checked bag for international flights, even if you have economy seats. For domestic flights, if you're concerned about the cost of checking a bag, I would look into like an airline co-branded credit card that can offer you free bags. For example, I know the Delta card offers one free bag per family member on that same itinerary, I think up to eight, or something like the Amex Platinum that can reimburse you for the baggage fees. So look into to those, it was super handy to not have all these things to carry because inevitably there's always some kid that's either running away or needs help going to the bathroom or this or that. The variables are endless and so as many free hands as you can conserve would be ideal. As for what to wear, we had a proper fall jacket which proved to be a little too much. I would vote dress in light layers so on the way back we definitely pared down on our jackets and coats because on average planes are just hot. Plus Plus, they usually have blankets on the plane, so if you do get cold, it's an easy fix. Still on the theme of packing, we didn't have kids carry their own bags or pack their own carry-on. I love the idea, I think it's really cute, and it teaches them responsibility and looking after their things and having some level of ownership during their travel. However, we also had to think worst case scenario, which is if they were too tired and not willing to carry their own bags, then it would mean me and my husband would have our bag, the strollers, the children, plus those extra tiny little bags. And I think this might be something we can practice on a shorter trip at a different time, but not for something like this that is 30 hours where it's already going to be challenging. And then in general, for the time frame of packing, I am so glad that we started super early because there's always extra laundries to do, extra things that we might have to go to the store and buy before we head out, and it's good to budget extra time ahead. Chapter three, getting to and from the airport. I think the main pain point if you travel with children is 
you could drive to the airport in your own car, however, then you would have to pay for parking there, which could be expensive depending on how long your trip is. And most parking lots for airports are still kind of far away. So then you would still have to haul all of your things onto the shuttle that takes you to the actual airport. And mind you, this would be like multiple kids, multiple car seats, bunch of strollers and bags, which would be kind of a hassle. However, if you took like a cab or an Uber, there are no car seats, right? So if you have young Young children that poses a whole other thing do you then install this car seat on this taxi and then remove it like what do you do there so the hack here is to have someone drop you off which I know sounds like well duh obviously if you can have someone drop it off isn't that nice but what we did was have our babysitter come to our house and then help us load the children into the car which might I remind you it was 3 a.m. and so having that extra set of hands was so extra helpful and she drove us to the airport in our car she dropped us off, took the car back to the garage, and then drove home. And then on the way returning, she did the reverse. She picked up our car from our house to come pick us up at the airport. Obviously, it depends if you have someone you can trust who can do that. But even if you have to pay for something like this, it is so absolutely worth it. The bonus thing about this is on the way back, our babysitter could also help us get the kids showered and settled after this long journey when my husband and I were also super tired and really needed that extra help. On the Hong Kong side, my parents helped pick us up. They took the bags and chauffeured the kids while my husband and I took the cab because there wasn't enough seating in the one car. One more point on packing is optimizing going through security. Now we didn't have TSA pre-check because it was a really small airport that didn't do it anyway, but I would highly recommend looking into that if that's an option to you because this will save you some of the time of pulling out all your laptops, taking off your shoes and doing the extra stuff that is entailed in a normal security security line in the US. If you do go through the regular security line, one tip I have is to pack with the anticipation that you have to pull these out. So consolidate all of your liquids for the whole family into one Ziploc if you can. Consolidate all of your kids' snacks like the apple pouches, the milk containers, all the things that are allowable for kids but over the fluid limit. Pack those together and then making sure all of your electronics are somewhat consolidated and easy to remove and return so that you're not fumbling around in line looking for, oh, is there a phone here? Is there another extra camera? in this bag, what am I doing? while people are impatiently waiting behind you and your kids are going nuts. Whatever you can do in the packing stage to streamline that would be so tremendously helpful. This brings me to chapter four, which is getting around within the airport. I feel like when I talk about this in real life with my friends, there's always a debate of do you do a stroller or do you do a carrier? The appeal of the carrier is that you don't have to then fold up a stroller and gate check it and do all of those things. But for a long flight like this and for being outnumbered with two adults to three children, Children, I think stroller is the best option because between all the bags and kids, it gets really heavy if you have to carry everyone. And so the ability to plop them into a stroller seat, and even if they're unwilling to sit there, or even if they're exploring, for example, at least you can put your backpack down and give yourself a little bit of a rest. We chose the stroller route and we had a double stroller for the girls and a single stroller for the baby. Both of the strollers we kept for moving around in the airport and then gate checked it right as we were boarding. The staff can put a little tag on it and associate it with your plane ticket. You just kind of drop it off at the end of the runway and you get to pick it up right as the plane lands at the same runway area. I know there are smaller strollers that can fold up and you can bring into the plane and stuff it into the overhead bin. I find that kind of pointless. Our baby stroller actually does fold up this way and fits over the overhead bin. However, we have never done this because A, the aisles in the plane are pretty small, so will I actually even roll the stroller in? And B, even if it's easy to roll down the aisle going in, on the way back out, you know how everyone just stands up the minute the plane lands, even before the seatbelt sign goes off. And so all of your hallways are kind of just packed and to be able to reach the stroller from the overhead bin unfolded amidst all this other people and plop your kid in. Meanwhile, your kids are probably also asking to be picked up and asking for this, asking for that. Just not practical. So we always just gate check it and it works out just fine. For car seats, I know there's like the Pico car seat and we actually have a Pico. It folds up really nicely. It could be like a backpack and you can bring it onto the plane and you never have to part with it. You could even install it into the airplane seat 
and let your kids sit there. But in practice, we have never done this because that's one more thing to carry. I already have backpacks and strollers and actual children. I don't really need to carry this one more thing unless it is going to help me. Chapter five is about optimizing the time you spend at the airport. And I have one word for you, lounges. We didn't really do this in the past when we were traveling just as a couple, but as a family, they are so helpful in A, having food and drink in one place. If you think about it, you often end up buying water or other beverages, coffee, snacks, and meals at the airport and it really adds up when you're traveling as a family so to have a place that you can go to where food and drink is already included is so much easier and you don't have to manage like the transaction for each item when worrying about okay family member a wants a bagel so we need to go to this place and family member b wants the fruit cup and now we need to go to this other place everything is just in one place and it's just so much easier to have a buffet style additionally if you need to make formula and you need it to be slightly warm because you have really picky babies. It's so much easier to find that in a lounge. And the second thing is lounges usually have a little better bathrooms. I don't know about you, but I don't love bringing my kids to public bathrooms. They're always touching things. There's always like so many people. They can't wait in line because they are always going last minute. So it's much easier to have an uncrowded space with slightly cleaner bathrooms, especially for the little ones. And then the third and I think most important part of how lounges help is in confining the children. If you're at the gate or if you're at a restaurant, you pretty much have to get the kids to like stay seated within that small area. And if they run off, there's really no limit to how far they can get. Whereas in a lounge, you can set your stuff up at a table, get all your things settled in, and the kids can go get their own water and bring it back if they're thirsty. They can visit the bathroom. They can do a lot of things kind of on their own and explore the general area where you are. And you know they won't exit the lounge. There's like a finite amount of space that they can explore. And if you're a parent, you'll understand how tremendous helpful that is, especially on a long travel day. As far as how to access lounges, there are so many videos on YouTube. The basic premise is A, either you have a first or business class ticket, which we didn't, or you have a lounge membership that you can purchase directly, which is also not how we did it. Or third, and I think probably the most common method is by having a credit card that gives you access. For example, the Admirals Club, which is the American Airlines lounge in Chicago, we accessed by paying for a day pass, which was $39. However, this got reimbursed through our Amex Platinum credit card, incidental airline travel credit. The food in Admiral's Club wasn't mind blowing. We had this avocado toast station. There were also like some meatballs and pastas, pretty standard offerings, but they did have a pretty good kids room where there was a TV and little chairs for little kids to sit at. That was a good space within the lounge for the kids to be a little louder and not bother other people. For the Hong Kong Centurion Lounge, just the credit card itself gives us access. They actually recently reopened and we kind of hit it right before they were about to implement some guest access changes. By the time this video is live, you now have to pay for guest access like your children. Their cocktails were really good and the food was solid, not the most mind blowing, but they did have this fish maw soup, which if you're Asian and you know your soups, you know what I mean, but it was perfect soul warming bowl of broth that you can have right before going to a plane. And then lastly, the Haneda ANA lounge in Tokyo was amazing. There was a noodle bar you could get your own ramen. The food was really good. There was a self-service cocktail bar. And we were actually really looking forward to going to the other ANA lounge in Narita on the way back. Unfortunately, we landed in Terminal 2 and we couldn't go to Terminal 1. They were only allowing passengers with a flight leaving from Terminal 1 to kind of access between the terminals. I think it must be from COVID rules. It kind of annoyed me because they had all these other shops, Burberry and Chanel and Prada. However, the whole terminal had like no food to eat. There were only two coffee shops and no lounges. And honestly, I had never been hungry ever in Tokyo before. So that was a disappointment. I think the lesson here is to have a backup plan in case the lounge access doesn't work out. Now moving on to chapter six, 
is getting onto the plane. Most airlines prioritize boarding for families, even ahead of their airline elite status travelers or business and first class. We usually take them up on this offer and try to settle in first, but I know there are also families that like to have kids run around in the airport until the very last minute, burn off all that energy and board last. I think that's really up to you and what works for your family. You know your kids best. I also know there are families that have one spouse board with all their bags first and then have the kids stay out with the other spouse running around. I'm not signing up for that. I have three kids. Like, can you imagine? It'd be insane if one of them ran away and had to chase one person down holding the other two. So what we usually like to do is spend as much time as we can at the lounge and then leave and immediately board, leaving very little time in between to hang out by the gate. Make sure you get all of your diaper changing and pottying done before you board the plane. This might sound obvious, but those airplane bathrooms are just so tiny and kind of questionable. We like to avoid them if we can. And then chapter seven is the time on the plane. My biggest hack is tablets. I don't care what you think about screens. You need it when it's a 30 hour day. And if you're at all feeling conflicted about introducing screens, during the flight, I'll link to an Instagram account from a gamer educator that was introduced to me by a friend and I've found their content really helpful in terms of reframing the approach and conversation around screen time. My main tips surrounding the whole screen topic is A, bring a charger and B, predefine a stopping point. We made the mistake of just letting them have a tablet till whenever and it was hard to get them to stop and go take a nap, take a rest. Um, and obviously you probably don't wanna cause a scene while you're in the plane, so that becomes kind of a power struggle. If you can predefine a stopping point, it might make that transition a little bit easier. The problem with going on a screen for too long is just that they get so tired and eventually when they do fall asleep, it would be at the most inconvenient time, like an hour before we were supposed to get off the plane. And then we ended up having to like pick them up and help them get off the plane and that was rough. For the baby, he was pretty much active like this the entire flight. And so we actually didn't bring a whole lot of toys because the toy is never the entertaining thing. It's always the camera or like a gadget or the remotes or the little screens or other passengers. I wouldn't worry too much about looking on Amazon and looking on Pinterest or wherever else to find plain toys. Comfort wise, we didn't have any problems with ears popping, with the pressure changes. One tip if your baby has that problem is if you nurse or give them a bottle during that time, that often helps. For kids, you can bring like little suckers. With the time shift, usually the flights will try to get you to start adjusting by dimming the lights and serving meals relative to local time of your destination. It is hard to follow a specific routine for babies or kids while flying on the plane. So we like to use our home time as kind of the gauge on, okay, baby's probably going to be hungry around this time or going to need a nap soon. As much as possible, follow those plane cues and nap when it's dark and be awake when the lights turn on because the sooner you adjust the time difference, the more enjoyable things will be when you get to your destination. Also, as far as things to pack for the flight, for babies, obviously bring diapers. I've heard people do one diaper per hour. We would have 30 diapers, which is insane. Instead, we did one for every two hours, so 15. You need wipes, you need a change of clothes, formula if you're using, and we pre-filled the quantities so that you don't have to be on the plane and have germy hands in a tight space trying to like scoop stuff up from the original bottle. We had a little bit of water for mixing formula kind of as a backup. Bring solids if your baby's doing solids, just a couple toys, and make sure you bring a pillow for your arm because if you're holding your baby and he's sleeping kind of sideways, it is much easier to have some ergonomic support for your arm. Also, of course, hand sanitizers. For kids, other than the tablet, you wanna bring some extra snacks, maybe an activity book or some other quiet activity that can give their eyes a break from the screen. For grown-ups, the most important thing is the phone charger and all your important documents, maybe a snack, and you really don't need to think about bringing any entertainment because you will be plenty entertained and plenty busy with your children on the flight. And then my last tip about what to do on the plane is just try to have low expectations. My husband and I have done plenty of long haul trips, so we're no stranger to being at the airport and flying and time zone changes. 
this was by far the hardest. Don't plan on reading a book or accomplishing anything crazy or watching a movie. Like, none of that is actually going to happen. If you're lucky, you get a nap. Just mentally prepare yourself on living a 30-hour day and be prepared to roll with whatever comes your way. I mean, really, it is a hard experience, both for yourself and for the kids, so give everyone a little bit of grace. Chapter 8 is arrival tips. At this point, everyone's going to be completely exhausted, so expect to have to carry some of the children. And this is really where the minimal carry-on approach is key and where your stroller will really Come in handy. The second thing is whatever you can do ahead of time and prep, do that. So one example is having foreign currency on hand so that you don't have to drag all your bags and your tired children and your tired self to then go to the bank. The alternative to carrying foreign currency is to just have a credit card that has no foreign transaction fees. However, there are limitations. For example, like Hong Kong doesn't do a lot of American Express or if you need to take a cab, then it's cash only. So having foreign foreign currency available would still be my preference. And the other thing you can pre-figure out is your phone situation. We call T-Mobile to add on an international data plan so that the minute we arrive, it is already activated. We can already call and use the internet and whatnot. You can also go the SIM card route, but then that requires your phone to be unlocked from your US carrier. Whichever route you choose, this is something you should look into ahead of time. Also, just a heads up for the return flight into the US. We had to clear customs at the first entry point. So in Chicago, we had to pick up all of our bags, even though they were checked through the final destination. We had to at least pick them up in that interim and clear customs. It is pretty short-lived, but for that few minutes, you do have to figure out how you're gonna manage all of your bags, your car seats, your children, and your strollers, and push them through this custom section. And congratulations, you made it to the end of the video, and you're officially ready for any family trip. If you have other helpful family travel tips, please leave them below and please consider subscribing if you enjoy family travel related content. I hope this video didn't scare anyone off from traveling. It was hard being outnumbered with little kids, but we made it, right? And the trip itself was amazing. And so the flight was absolutely worth it. And we actually plan on going back later this year. So if that tells you anything, let me know if you have any questions and if you're planning a trip, good luck. And I will see you again next time. Bye.